Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this talk about memory noisy neighbor. What if I told you that a small group of engineers got together and developed this secret capability that allowed them to run their workloads 20 to 50% more efficiently on less hardware and get, you know, significantly reduce stay latency four times, five times, 13 times, that would sound fantastic, right? How could we not know about this? Well, it turns out this capability seems to actually exist, uh, but the development has not been uh, done in secret. Uh, there have been dozens of papers over the last decades from hyperscalers, from well-known uh, research universities showing this capability. So in this talk, I'd like to give an overview of what uh, I believe the, the kind of knowledge there is out there. Uh, the reason I'm giving this talk is because I think that there's enough knowledge out there that this, we can make this into practical systems that can generalize across the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, you might know one of uh, these surveys. Uh, this one was published by Datadog in 2023, showing that many of the containers that we run in systems today uh, use a lot less than the CPU that we request for them. So I want to run a similar survey here today, and I'm going to ask y'all to please raise your hands if you know the average uh, CPU utilization in a production Kubernetes cluster. Hands up. All right. And then... Uh, leave your hands up uh, if the cluster utilization is above 20%. Okay, I guess uh, a third lowered their hands. Above 30%. Yeah, uh, I guess another third uh, lowered their hand. Above 40? Anybody has a cluster with above 50% CPU utilization with users facing traffic? Wow, so good on you. Well, if, if uh, you said between 20 and 40%, you're in very good company. Uh, some of the largest companies on the planet uh, with large engineering teams capable of optimizing their deployments have published average CPU utilization between 20 and 40%. But what seems to have happened in the last few years is that some companies have been able to increase their efficiency quite substantially. Uh, Google was around 35% CPU utilization in 2011 and increased to 50% the reported CPU utilization in 2019. So what happened? How did they manage to increase their efficiency so substantially? Well, reading published work, I found uh, at least two contributors to that efficiency gain. So one of them is advancement in vertical pod autoscaling. And there's a very interesting paper published by Google called Autopilot in Eurosys 2020. And this is not the GKE Autopilot, if you're familiar with this. This is a separate system that they integrated into Borg and where they discuss how they change the CPU and memory requirements on live pods as they are running to increase the density in their deployments. Um, to the Kubernetes community, there are a couple of companies that uh, take care of, of providing this type of vertical horizontal pod autoscaling, like, uh, you know, perfect scale, Stormforge and others. Um, and so this is one of the con contributors to efficiency. The other one, which is the subject of this talk, is handling noisy neighbor. This enables companies to spend less CPU cycles processing every request, reduce tail latency, so they can pack workloads tighter. I've divided the talk into four sections. And instead of doing a deep dive into one system, one implementation, and giving all of the details on the one system, I've instead opted to give a broad overview of what I think the knowledge is. So to give you a concept of what the problem is and how companies are solving it. So let's start with the problem. What is memory noisy neighbor? How does it affect pods? And do I actually have it in my cluster? Cloud, our cloud-native applications run ultimately on physical hardware. And these applications have to share that finite resources that the physical hardware has to offer. In Noisy Neighbor, one application consumes a lot more than its fair share. 
And this means that the other applications cannot get access to the resources that they need, and so their performance degrades. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the memory subsystem, which are these two resources, the last level cache, which I'm just going to call cache, and the memory bandwidth. So in this benchmark, uh, the workload varies how much, how many reads and writes it performs to memory. So in fact, changing the amount of memory bandwidth that it consumes. Uh, the benchmark then measures the memory access latency at each of these memory bandwidths. So as you can see, as, as the benchmark application consumes more and more memory, the access latency increases kind of gradually. But then there's a knee curve at the 80% mark, the 90 gigabytes per second over there, where memory access latency starts to increase very quickly with additional memory bandwidth. So what this means is if you have this one noisy neighbor, one application that drives the system from the 80% bandwidth utilization to 100% utilization, it then causes the memory access latency to, to almost double. And every application running on that system experiences these slower memory access times. So this is essentially memory noisy neighbor. So you, you might ask, uh, you know, CPUs have several mechanisms that uh, are supposed to hide memory latency and protect us from these cases of high uh, memory access latency. You have prefetchers. So the prefetchers try to read data from DRAM onto caches ahead of time so that when the CPU needs it, it already has it there, doesn't have to wait for it. You have the reorder buffer that allows the CPU to exe execute instructions out of order. Uh, so while it's waiting for memory, it might be able to execute other instructions that are you know, after the memory read. And caches keep uh, frequently accessed data on the CPU so you don't have to reread it. And so the question is, do all of these mechanisms actually protect us from high memory access latency or not? There's a very popular metric in order to measure whether CPUs uh, suffer from high memory access latency, which is cycles per instruction, or CPI. The idea is that as CPUs wait for memory, they incur these stall cycles where they are waiting for memory, they cannot do useful work. So the number of overall cycles increases, but the number of instructions they are able to retire, the useful work doesn't increase. So the ratio is high when there's high uh, memory latency. And so the question is, um, so let's, let's see whether CPI increases when there's high memory latency or not. So are these mechanisms effective? Here are measurements taken by Alibaba in a trace that Alibaba Cloud published in 2022. Uh, they measured a cluster with over 8,000 physical hosts running over a million containers, and they sampled these low-level uh, microarchitectural metrics like memory bandwidth, memory latency, and cycles per instruction. And they did this over a 24-hour period and published it. Uh, what you can see here on the left graph uh, shows on the x-axis is memory bandwidth, on the y-axis is memory latency. So this is similar to the graph we, show, we saw two slides ago. And here you can also see kind of gradually increases the latency with memory bandwidth, and then you have the knee. And on the right-hand side is a graph where the x-axis is memory latency, and the y-axis is uh, CPI, cycles per instructions. I'll take questions at the end. Um, As far as I understand, the question was, is it for external, like public cloud or internal workloads? I, as far as I understand it, internal workloads. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, the, on the x-axis, as I said, latency on the y-axis CPI. And you can see that, in, indeed, they were able to see a correlation. When there's high memory access latency, there's high CPI. So in this cluster, what does it mean to have a noisy neighbor? So if you have an application driving the memory bandwidth up 80%, like we saw before, it would double the latency, and it translates to a 25% increase in CPI. This means you have one memory, uh, you know, memory noisy neighbor, and then all of the applications, they, have, they need to spend 25% more cycles to do the same amount of work. And I'll note that uh, this benchmark by Alibaba Cloud already had mitigation for cache noisy neighbor. So I, we had two resources, the caches and the memory bandwidth. So they already mitigated cache noisy neighbor. So in a system that doesn't have 
neither cache uh, noisy neighbor mitigation and memory bandwidth noisy neighbor, the number would be a lot more than 25%. So this is a lower bound on how much you could save by tackling noisy neighbor. Okay, so we looked at the efficiency angle, you know, how much more faster you could run on average by tackling noisy neighbor. Is there uh, an impact on tail latency? Well, it turns out that the impact on tail latency is very, very substantial. So here are measurements uh, published by Google in 2015. The three tables that you see here are three production workloads that th they tested. The top one, web search, is the Google search node. Uh, ML cluster is a machine learning text classification, uh, real-time service that answers users' queries. And memkeyval is an in-memory key value store like memcache. The rows in the table are the different uh, noisy neighbor generators that they use. So baseline is without a noisy neighbor. Then LLC are three cache noisy neighbor generators with different intensities, small, medium, and big. And DRAM is the memory bandwidth noisy neighbor. The columns are the load on the workload, the, on the production workload that they measured. And the numbers in the table are the tail latency that they measured as a fraction of their SLO target. So maybe this 116%, 116% that you see here means that if they had an SLO target of something, you know, let's say 100 milliseconds, this was 116 tail latency, uh, millisecond tail latency. And what you can see from these is that there is a very substantial uh, increase in tail latency with, when you have memory noisy neighbor. More than four times in web search, more than five times for ML cluster, and more than 13 times in the memcache equivalent. So there is a huge increase in tail latency due to no noisy neighbor. So I'd like to run another survey. This is the second survey and the last, I promise. Uh, please raise your hand if you know what type of nodes run in a production Kubernetes cluster. So are they bare metal? Are they the four extra larges, eight extra larges? It doesn't have to be the exact ones, but roughly. Okay, now leave your hand up, please, if you only use, uh, you never use a fraction of a physical CPU. You only use the bare metal. You only use maybe like half of, uh, half of the size, of the maximal size of the node. Yeah, I guess most, most, most hands uh, dropped. And so, you know, it's very common to use the four extra larges or the eight extra larges, right? Like a few cores. You don't have to have the bare metal big machines. Uh, so let's look at this. Uh, you know, best practices in our community is to separate our big data analytics clusters from our production, user-facing, latency-sensitive workloads. And the reason is you don't want somebody to run this big data analytics job and ruin the performance of your production uh, traffic, of your production workloads. And so it turns out if you're running this in something like a public cloud or private cloud with multi-tenancy and you're not taking the full CPUs, which is what the survey was, you're actually running something like this. Your workloads are running, or your production workloads are running next to VMs from other users. And in fact, some random users in the, in the cloud, some random dudes are running workloads next to your workload. So, you know, why are we doing this? Right. We, we wanted to avoid this situation. And, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, people ask, does, does my cloud provider actually support tackling this type of noisy neighbor? Uh, I wasn't able to find uh, too much uh, information about that. So um, there is evidence that some cloud providers do support this, but, you know, your mileage may vary. And so consider this. Engineers spend months and maybe years of work trying to optimize the performance that user workloads experience. You know, you could, you could be uh, changing or adding database indices, changing data schemas so that queries are run faster. You might take a service and split it into m multiple microservices so that uh, transaction processing happens in parallel. Um, and you're just profiling and, and alleviating, alleviating bottleneck. And all this work that engineers do can be completely erased, obliterated by memory noisy neighbor that decreases the performance of the underlying compute infrastructure. And, and so the next question we have to ask ourselves is, do we really need some batch analytics to run next to our workloads in order to experience noisy neighbor? Uh, 
It turns out that no, even regular workloads can be noisy, neighbor, uh, noisy neighbors. Uh, in this experiment run by MIT researchers in 2020, they ran memcache alongside a garbage collected workload. And you can see on the top graph here the memory bandwidth with the two workloads running, everything's fine. Um, they use relatively little memory bandwidth. But as the garbage collection mark phase starts, memory bandwidth essentially saturates. If you look at the memcache latency graph on the bottom, you'll see that memcache was usually around 50 microseconds, T latency P99.9. .9. Uh, but then as the, as the mark phase start, started, latency increases by three orders of magnitude, right? Thousand times. And uh, this means that even a garbage collected workload can be noisy neighbor in your system. And there are other examples of memory intensive workloads. Uh, for example, if you have live image uh, runtime security, live image scanning in your, in your cluster, uh, if you do video streaming, transcoding, Container images come compressed, so even decompressing container images is memory intensive, and so on, right? Many different workloads. So let's summarize so far. Uh, memory noisy neighbor shows up as high memory access latency, which translates to high cycles per instruction, which means it looks like there's just high CPU, looks like the system is really working hard, but in effect, it's not doing useful work. T latency also suffers significantly from memory noisy neighbor, and we've seen four times, five times, 13 times. And you might have noisy neighbors from VMs running alongside you, but even your own pods uh, could be generating this type of noisy neighbor. Okay, so let's see what's currently available to mitigate noisy neighbor. Modern CPUs allow direct control over the amount of resources that each application can use. Uh, you can decide what fraction of caches each application can consume and how much memory bandwidth it can use. The other method to control uh, noisy neighbor is to limit, reduce the opportunity that the noisy neighbor has to consume resources. So you can, uh, you can reduce the number of cores that the noisy neighbor has or pin it to uh, a very small subset of cores, or you can change the frequency of these cores. And the idea is if the noisy neighbor has less cycles in order to create noise, it would interfere less. So these are the main, if you look at, uh, at systems, these are the two main, like the direct control and indirect control that, that you'll see. I get this question a lot. I'm running containers. Shouldn't C group handle this for me? And in fact, C group has uh, CPU and memory uh, controllers, but they don't tackle memory bandwidth and caches. But not all is lost uh, because the kernel does have a different subsystem uh, called res control or resource control that is able to allocate both of these re resources, measure and allocate, in fact. And the reason for this is historical. In uh, 2016, Intel contributed support for their uh, hardware. Uh, and back then, the kernel engineers decided not to put the support in C groups, but rather implement a new subsystem. In 2018, AMD contributed support to AMD hardware, and ARM is in process of contributing support. I'd like to now show a quick demo, and this demo was recorded by folks at Meta, uh, led by Tejin Hao, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge those folks and uh, send kudos to those for creating this demo. It's called the Facebook Resource Control Demo. So I'll narrate. Here you can see in green transactions per second and in blue latency of a latency sensitive workload. Let's start a noisy neighbor. You can see that the uh, request per second drops and latency increases. We'll stop the noisy neighbor and let the latency sensitive workload converge to the good performance. And now let's run the noisy neighbors with resource allocation. And you can see on the bottom, there's a, a compile job running and the, the latency sensitive workload is fine. Hypervisors have 
some support for memory and cache allocation. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there's just such a scarcity of uh, information out there. Uh, from the way I read the documentation that you could find, uh, the, it probably it is mostly used in, in niche use cases in telco and finance. So at least that's my impression from reading uh, what's available. All right, so we saw that there is hardware support for allocation and that Linux has support. What systems can we build in order to control noisy neighbor? And so I'll go through these three type major, major types of systems. And if you read papers, most of the systems fall into these three major categories. I'll start with cycles per instruction. Um, and the idea here is what we've seen before. When there's high memory contention, the CPI is going to be high. Uh, the major challenge that these systems have is that they don't know what a good CPI reading is. Is three good? Is three bad? Is five good? Is five bad? So they have to create these profiles per task to understand what's a good measurement and what's a bad measurement. They can then use these profiles uh, in, in running clusters to see which tasks have outlier measurements. And if a task has a high CPI measurement for several measurement intervals, then it's declared an outlier. The system then needs to find what is the noisy neighbor affecting that task. And it does that with the insight that uh, when the noisy neighbor has more CPU, it utilizes more CPU, it creates more noise. So it affects the CPI of the outlier more. So what the, these systems do is they take the CPI measurements of the outlier and the CPU utilization of every other task and then correlate them together. And when they find a good correlation, that's the noisy neighbor and they can limit it. The major disadvantage of these type of systems is that CPI is extremely noisy. So these systems need to aggregate it, to average it over long periods of time of minutes in order to make good decisions, to get a good signal. And the problem is that by the time the system finally makes a decision, a lot of damage has already been done. And so that's the major disadvantage of this, these systems. Uh, another disadvantage is the need to create these profiles. So these systems have these centralized component that uh, takes the measurements from all tasks in the cluster, aggregates it, and then distributes it back, which adds to complexity. However, according to Google, even with this complexity, uh, in this 2013 paper they published, as of the paper writing, it had been deployed to all of Google's shared compute infrastructure. So internally. Okay, let's move to the second type of system, latency control. So this system measures application layer latencies. And this is great because this is what we're trying to optimize. We want to hit our SLO targets, right? The system then computes the percent of the SLO target for each application that we run. And then finds, so maybe uh, I'll give an example, right? Like maybe one application has 50% of its target SLO, target P95%, uh, P95, and another one is 98% so it's, uh, of its target SLO, so it's about to breach its SLO. So there's a fast one and a slow task. And this system chooses the fastest task and the slowest task, and then moves resources from the fast to the slow. So think about it as like a Robin Hood allocator. Right, so it takes from the fast, gives to the slow. Um, so the, the problem here is that application layer latency is also noisy. Uh, your application might be making downstream calls to a database or another microservice. And really, there's a lot of variability in processing each request. Maybe requests are long, take longer or shorter. So you really need the averaging. So it's another, like, similar to the CPI. That's a disadvantage. Uh, but at least you don't need to create these profiles because you know what's a good measurement because you know what the target SLO is that you're trying to hit. And uh, another disadvantage is usually it's really hard for organizations to expose latency in a uniform way across the entire uh, portfolio of applications that they have. So, Okay, let's move to the third category, which I call usage control. This, these systems explicitly measure cache utilization and memory bandwidth per application, and then finds applications that are using too much and limits those. So here's an example with cache allocation. So the system measures the actual cache usage of applications, and it computes a fair share 
what it thinks the allocation should be. And maybe that fair share is proportional to the number of millicores in the CPU requests, right? Proportional to the size of the workload. The system then applies a similarity function uh, to compare the actual and fair allocations. If they're close together enough, then you don't need to do anything. But if they're far, then the system limits the, the applications that use more than their fair share to their fair share. The major uh, issue here is, do we really want fair allocation? Maybe some of my applications need a lot more help in order to hit their SLOs. Uh, but remember that the goal here is to limit the, these egregious behaviors by noisy neighbor where they drive the system to this high CPI, high T latency, right? And just ruin the performance for everybody. So just by making sure that those egregious noisy neighbors are limited to their fair share, you can ensure that the T latency is reduced dramatically for everybody else so they can hit their SLOs. So you get, all, you get practically all of the benefit just by doing fairness. These systems are very easy to build. They re don't require these centralized components. Uh, and you measure the resources that you actually control. So uh, it's easy to reason about these systems, and they can react very quickly to changes. Uh, according to this paper uh, in the bottom here from Alibaba uh, in 2020, uh, this had been deployed to an order of 1 million cores in production for over two years back in 2020. So to summarize, we have these three categories of mitigation systems. If you read papers, you'll find that there are a lot of good ideas out there. And in fact, there are enough good ideas that we can cobble together a good general purpose system uh, for Kubernetes. And especially I like these third kind of systems, the usage control, because they're simple and effective. And I think as a community, we should go towards these type three systems. All right, the last part of our talk is, what are next steps for the Kubernetes community? How can we uh, progress in order to get the benefit from ne noisy neighbor mitigation? How would a Kubernetes deployment look? You'd have a daemon set deploying these two components. One is the memory collector that measures resource utilization. It measures the cache utilization, the memory bandwidth utilization, and maybe CPI per application. And then the interference controller takes these measurements, makes the decision who to throttle, and configures Linux resource control. So just what we saw in the, in, in the third type of system. In fact, there is a third component that we need to implement, which is observability, where you take the memory metrics and you expose them to different observability backends. In fact, I think we should start with observability. And the reason is, in practice, to get adoption, we need operators uh, to have uh, a first a, a good idea of the benefit that they're going to experience if they deploy another controller to the system. And second, if anything goes wrong in the cluster, not related to this controller maybe, operators really need to know that this controller uh, is behaving as expected and not causing that uh, you know, incident. And so I've started... Uh, project called the memory collector. There's a GitHub repo over here on the slides. And I would like to invite everybody here to participate if you're interested. If you want to make re repository contributions, we are looking for contributors to the collector and also would like to develop a set of test beds and benchmarks uh, for Kubernetes where we can test the correctness of the collector and also uh, show memory noisy neighbor as a demo. Uh, if, even if you don't have time to contribute, if you want to hear more, or if you, can, uh, you think you can deploy the memory collector to maybe test or staging environments, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you either way. And the idea is, let's make sure that th this collector works across the widest variety of environments possible. Uh, so to finish, um, I hope we can drive the community to these, to these better efficiencies and lower tail latencies, and really allow the performance work that engineers do to shine through. And so thank you for coming, and uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, please come to the microphones. Thank you.
Hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the fantastic talk. Uh, it was great. So, um, are you factoring networking out of this equation because quality of service in Kubernetes networking is non-existent today, I guess? But, Good question. Um, there is, so, question as far as I, I hear it is, you know, there are other noisy neighbors, right? Maybe networking. In fact, if you look at the, the Google 2015 paper, it explores more than just these two noisy neighbors. It has network noisy neighbor, power noisy neighbor, where you have some cores uh, heating up your processors and then this, the whole processor needs to cool down so it lowers the frequency and everybody suffers. Uh, and it has hyper-threading uh, noisy neighbor where you have two workloads running on, this, on two hyper-threads of, of the same cores and competing for, for physical resources. Um, and so, yes, you probably want to solve all of them. I think memory noisy neighbor is one uh, arguably most egregious, it seems, at this point. And, uh, so it, and, and unknown, you know, the, it's not visible. And uh, so uh, I think we should tackle it first, although, you know, maybe we should tackle all of them. I think eventually we should tackle all of them. I'm, well, let's work through them in, in, uh, in sequence. Cool. Um, the second question is, one of your proposed solution basically implements a throttler that kind of looks at... Implement what, sorry? Um, hello, yeah. So uh, in one of your last slides, you mentioned that the proposed solution implements a throttler that kind of throttles um, bad actors, right? Um, but wouldn't uh, cluster operators need to manage the thresholds on how often you run the throttling mechanism to, like, is it a system that would just work automatically or are we just introducing another knob? Uh, like, I've, I've seen some papers from a networking perspective that try to do this uh, from Google and Meta. Uh, they try to do the same thing, but I don't know if it's a general purpose solution. Um, yeah, so the question is, does this require configuration or or uh, kind of is there a knob that you need to really tune in order to get the system to work right? And I believe that for memory noisy neighbor, there shouldn't be a knob. We should be able to build fully automatic systems that uh, do the right thing. And maybe adapting every one millisecond or every 100 microseconds. You asked, I think part of your question was, do you need to choose how often to adjust these resources? I think the decision can be made locally to the node, at least to begin with. And, to, and the frequency would be either auto-tuned or kind of a fixed low number. And that would work very well uh, without the need for auto-tuning or part indeed any participation from the scheduler. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the talk again, really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious about the feedback to the teams we're throttling. So how, how does that get back into them? Is there any uh, talks about what we should be doing? Because there's some training aspects we feel like are missing in terms of like building cloud native apps in the right way. And some of what we see from noisy neighbors is related to some of that. And so what's the feedback? Do they talk anything about the papers or have any thoughts about how you give that feedback to the teams and what training we might need to provide and what ways that, how that all works? Yes, thank you for that question. So uh, the question is, uh, do developers need to have access to uh, their, their application's behavior? And should they, do, would they need to adjust their behavior? And how do we, make the, how do we close that loop? Um, so I think to begin with, if you have a garbage collected workload, that's not something that developers usually want or will exert uh, influence over. And so for garbage collected workloads, if they take 100 milliseconds or 110 milliseconds and they're just throttled a little bit uh, to save the performance of everybody else, that you even don't need to report to back to users. So you can get a lot. There's a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit there. Uh, but I think maybe as a second step, um, this type of collection should be integrated into profilers so that uh, application developers, if they're doing something egregious, could find it. I don't know of any kind of specific behavior that application developers w kind of would, would find. Maybe there are. Once we instrument, if we have visibility, we'd be able to find these, maybe. Uh, so last question. Yeah. Uh, a very insightful talk. Thank you for that. Um, as a cluster operator, I cannot go chase all of my developers, essentially. Are there metrics which are presently being exposed or would be in the near future for pod and even node level, which let me profile 
how much memory bandwidth is being used so that I have an insight about what's going on and then make decisions like I could put a certain class of workloads in a certain place or actually go target those developers. It's like, can we do something about some of this? So uh, th the question is, as an operator, can you get metrics about how my system is performing so I can make decisions maybe anti-affinity? If you have two workloads that are competing for memory bandwidth, I don't want them on the same node. Yes, that is part of what uh, Google published that they did initially. Uh, before they, I think before they had more automated, uh, actually, I think that, you know, th that, that is one of the techniques that were published. And uh, uh, definitely kind of visibility is what you want to start with, and this is why I'm advocating, let's build this, uh, this uh, collector so that we can see what's happening. Thank you for the question. And thanks everybody for coming. Uh, please uh, r rank it and uh, the talk. Thank you.